So um, some of you were not here when I made this announcement, but actually um, Chris actually cited Carol Cooper, and Carol Cooper is in the room right now. So raise your hand, Carol, so people know who you are. Yes. Carol should be celebrated um, and one of the best writers ever. So we are going to go to our third presentation, the fabulous fashionista of Karen Terman, who is always the best dressed at any symposium. Good morning. morning. Y'all can hear me? All right. Lower a little bit, yeah. Awesome. All right, cool. Um, I am always so honored and humbled to be here, and I just want to say thank you yet again to D'Angelo for bringing us all together and keeping these going. Um, and special shout out to Cam for helping me with the photos. Um, there's going to be a lot of photos in this, so because it's the visual style. Huh? Um, so I, okay, well, my name's Karen and I teach French. <laughs> and I've been thinking about Prince's fashion for a few years now. So um, my talk is entitled Creating an Image, Morris Day's Autonomy in the Prince Universe. So I began listening to Prince's music in the late 90s. Um, so I had to learn about the first half of his career through established narratives and listening out of context. Um, I really envy everybody that was at the Triple Threat tour that we were talking about yesterday. Um, I started reading voraciously about Prince in 2015 and have since learned about his incredible productivity and prolific work ethic. I also learned years after the fact about Prince as creator of the time and other acts such as Vanity Six that we spent yesterday discussing and the family. Now, this established narrative about Prince as creator resonated in the literature I was absorbing. Um, so Matt Thorne refers to him in the context of the Triple Threat Tour as puppet master to his protégés who were part of his musical experimentation. Uh, Ronan Rowe suggests that uh, Prince was influenced by the movie Idolmaker to create his side projects, and also Morris Day mentions that in his memoirs on time. Um, and Rowe also later employs the term Machiavellian when describing Prince training Morris Day on the vocals for the first time album. Uh, ben Greenman mentions the, quote, behind the scenes manipulation of the time as an external projection of Prince's it. Um, now, this idea of Prince as creator of musical acts, to me, evokes the Pygmalion figure of Greek mythology. Um, which became popularized in the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphoses. And the artist Pygmalion sculpts his version of the ideal woman in ivory, uh, falls in love, and she in turn comes to life thanks to Aphrodite's divine intervention. A green man, he's the only uh, person I was reading on that also briefly mentions the Pygmalion trope in the context of the pop music industry. Quote, in pop music, female artists are often controlled by male artists. They are given songs to sing, costumes to wear, sometimes even new names to replace their real names, right? There's a long tradition of this. Pygmalion stories, which began in Ovid and crystallized into their modern formulation in George Bernard, Bernard Shaw's 1913 comedy of the same name, usually end with the older male figure falling in love with his protege. So we see these Pygmalion stories throughout literature and popular culture, particularly in cinema. Um, oftentimes the quote creator plays the role of educator as in My Fair Lady in which uh, Professor Henry Higgins, plays by Rex Harrison, um, sculpts a proper English lady out of the lower class flower vendor Eliza Doolittle, Audrey Hepburn. Pretty Woman stars Julia Roberts as the Cinderella story of a prostitute who transforms into a wealthy businessman's elegant girlfriend with the help of his credit card and some compassionate personal assistance in Beverly Hills. 
Um, sometimes the feminine object of the desire is more literally inanimate, as in Kim Cattrall's mannequin, and Ryan Gosling's character's sex doll, and the strangely touching story about a village coming together to support a resident's mental health issues in Lars and the Real Girl. If you haven't checked this out, it sounds really weird, but it's actually really good. Um, so these stories often revolve, uh, resolve with the happily ever after Cinderella narrative of the inanimate or lower class feminine object of desire who transforms into a fully realized and sentient lover for the male sculptor or educator. In the context of Prince as Pygmalion creator, the group that fits most literally into this narrative is of course Vanity Six. Um, Denise Matthews as Prince's muse became Vanity, the lead singer of a group entirely designed by Prince with the time playing behind the curtain on stage. Um, and the story of the music group coming to life from Prince's vision really rings true to the myth here. But we're here to discuss the time. We've already talked about Vanity Six yesterday. And this myth of creating and curating the object of one's desires exists solely on the erasure of the creation's autonomy. So how does the Pygmalion myth apply to Prince's creation of the time? How does the band, or more precisely Morris Day, end up coming to life in the context of performance? And how and for whom does this, quote, Cinderella happy ending uh, transform itself? So first, let's take a look at the general style of aesthetic of the time as established in the 1980s. So this is in the wake of the um, peacock revolution of the 1960s and 70s, a time in men's fashion in which men were really encouraged to sport brighter, more flamboyant styles than we'd seen since the 18th century. And I appreciate that Seely was mentioning that in men's style in the 70s yesterday. Um, so in fact, if we trace men's fashion back to the roots of European dandyism, as we know it from uh, George Beau Brumel, uh, prior to the French Revolution of 1789, aristocratic men tended to present fancier and more embellished styles than women. After the attack of the Bastille prison in Paris, which led to the fall of the French monarchy and ultimately released a chain reaction of popular revolt throughout the Western world, uh, and no fewer than seven complete changes of government systems in France during the 19th century, many social codes were entirely upended and fashion was no exception. Um, so there's the French part, so we're done with that, and I can move on. All right, um, <laughs> men began to dress in a more subdued way, and the three-piece suit with trousers extended to the ankle was born and only really varied slightly in cut and style over the next two centuries. So we see a more flamboyant interpretation of the three-piece men's suit emerge in the US in the 1930s and 40s with black men in Harlem and Chicano men in Los Angeles wearing the zoot suit. Um, which I talked about a couple years ago, so I'm not going to go that in depth this time on that. Um, but basically, it's characterized by bright colors, large hats, high waisted pants with wide legs, and cinched or pegged ankles, oversized jacket. Um, some scholars, such as Kathy Pice, speculate that among the mo many possible origins of the zoot suit, it may have been created to be worn to dance the Lindy Hop at the Savoy Ballroom in Harlem, New York. The suit eventually became a symbol of rebellion with its excessive use of material during a period of wartime rationing. Luis Alvarez provides a comprehensive analysis of the intersections of race, uh, gender, and class issues at play in the historical context surrounding the zoot suit in his seminal book, The Power of the Zoot, Youth Culture and Resistance During World War II. So this look is brought back in the 80s and 90s, and we see the similar cuts in style in the uniform look worn by the time. Uh, and in Morris Day's bio, this is from his website and not the memoirs, but he does state that he was, quote, inspired by photographs of his grandpa in zoot suits. And there we see him in a zoot suit looking fly. All right. Um, according to many scholars, the time was created by Prince as a side project to express different sides of his personality. In Day's memoirs, he describes Prince's motivation behind creating the time. Quote, it's one thing to compete with your peers. It's another thing to create competition from within your own camp. This is ego merging. Prince saw me as an extension of himself. I was his creation. That was okay with me since, as creator, Prince was masterful. In line with the control that Prince maintained over the band, echoing famously authoritarian band leaders such as Cab Calloway and James Brown, he also dictated their art, art, um, sartorial aesthetic. 
So Laura Tebert, who was in the audience, hi Laura, um, <laughs> speculates that the origin of the time style could also be from Prince's fascination with his father's style. The time represented a look and vibe that Prince himself was not expressing at that time in the early 80s, and thus perhaps reflected a nostalgic moment for his father's heyday and the jazz and funk music aesthetic around which he was raised in North Minneapolis in the 60s and 70s. Uh, this photo depicts a young John Nelson, Prince's father, in the 1940s looking sharp with the Prince Rogers trio, which would eventually become his son's namesake, of course. And this black and white photo really reveals nothing out of the ordinary as far as the style of the group uh, in the context of that time, but features the classic men's tuxedos, roomy jackets, bow ties, pocket squares. Um, we can see the attention to the detail with all of the band members in a unified look and John Nelson front man on the piano sporting a contrasting colored jacket. And we know from Prince's memoirs, the beautiful one, that he was fascinated with his parents' style and even celebrate his father for, quote, outdressing his mother. And in the first few pages of the precious text we do have of his memoirs, he wrote, of all the family, friends, and relatives, my parents were the sharpest. No one could accessorize like they could. My mother's jewelry, gloves, and hats all had to match. My father's cufflinks, tie pins, and rings all sparkled within the shark skin frame of his suit. My father's suits were immaculate. There were so many of them. Every shirt had a co corresponding tie to go with it. My favorite was the arrowhead style that rested just under the collar. Matter of fact, my father always outdressed my mother. Maybe there was a secret contest going on that we weren't aware of. She never gave me the wink on that. Um, so while Prince definitely enjoys the stylized suits later in his life, uh, with the party man suit as a pivotal moment for the unique tailoring of his suits that would go on to define his style from the 90s through the 2000s. At this time of his career, he's presenting more femme with his women's lingerie, high heels, makeup, and lace. So looking closely at Day, his style is uh, quite reminiscent of a young little Richard, including the hair and facial expressions. His basic look includes high-waisted, wide-leg black trousers, a cut that goes back to the 40s, but was also back in style in the 1980s with a thin gold belt to hold them up. A thin black and gold striped tie complements the gold belt, while the gold tie clip also matches the shiny gold brocade jacket, so there's a theme here. Um, the accessories do not end with the tie clip as a true dandy with subtle yet intentionally coordinated styling. Uh, Day also sports cufflinks, uh, rings, and a watch because, of course, he needs to tell the time. <laughs> All right. Um, we can't forget his footwear, which is prominently mentioned in The Walk and eventually featured during the What's the Password scene in Purple Rain. The Stacey Adams Shoe Company was founded in 1875 in Brockton, Mass, Mass by William H. Stacey and Henry L. Adams. Uh, the brand specializes in zoot suit inspired fashion and casual hip hop wear for African American men. Back in the 1920s, their wingtips became popular thanks to Cab Calloway and Lionel Hampton pairing them with their zoot suits. Although the company is not black owned, the shoes symbolized cool style and were particularly associated with black communities in the Midwest such as Detroit and Chicago. By the 1960s, the shoes were offered in multiple colors um, and materials, branching out of the black or brown dress shoe limitations then in men's fashion. Stacey Adams shoes are also later mentioned in songs by Coolio and Snoop Dogg in the 1990s. Um, and of course, Day wraps up his memoirs um, with a, an awesome story about recording a track with Snoop Dogg, um, who he said treated him like royalty. So during the Triple Threat concert, Day also, or tour, um, Day also dons an overcoat and white silk fringe scarf when he wants to bring a more romantic vibe to the show. And of course, anyone with a song entitled Cool has to sport iconic sunglasses from time to time. So um, Han and Tebert state that Morris had, quote, gradually warmed to the idea and became intrigued by the character Prince was asking him to play, which was not entirely removed from Day's own flamboyant personality. The rest of the band is quite uniform, much like the Prince Rogers trio. Uh, Dave Hill, 
writes that the Times look was purchased in vintage and thrift stores, and Christopher just talked about that too, um, around Minneapolis, such as Tatters, uh, then on Lindale and Lake and Uptown. Um, and while Morris Day's suit fabric and shoes are more flamboyant in color and pattern, the rest of the band sports double-breasted jackets with wide lapels and shoulders and sometimes pinstripes, which translate to a more angular silhouette with a cinched waist that makes the shoulders appear wider, clearly reminiscent of the original zoot suit shapes. At this point, uh, suit colors tended to be neutral with matching shoes, thin black ties with tie clips, and white pocket squares. Terry Lewis and Monty Moyer always wear fedoras, um, and later Jimmy Jam, as you mentioned, um, completing the classic 1940s look. Jesse Johnson deserves his own slide for this, okay? So um, just like a little shout out. It's a big, big love to Jesse. So he's really the exception of this uniform look with the rest of the band. Eventually, I, in my opinion, upstaging day and aesthetic flamboyance at least as he develops his style with brighter pink, more lace, and longer jerry curls. So uh, Jesse Johnson's overall aesthetic is, is actually really right in line with the trends of the early 80s as inspired by the 40s, which um, my friends like to say is the 80s are pretty much the 40s on crack as far as fashion is concerned. Um, so if we are to understand day and the time as a specifically designed complement to prints, and of course these are not uh, chronologically aligned, this is prints much later. Um, this does mer merit further analysis, right? So scholars often describe Day's character as a light, comedic, hypermasculine foil um, to Prince's dark and brooding and tortured artist character, right? Uh, Day's misogynist persona is explicit while, um, although now after that 777 read, I'm like, Consent, interesting. Anyway, um, so Day or Prince plays the sensitive romantic lover who aims to please or to pleasure, really. Um, and Day was really the party man, while Prince was the workaholic. Um, both were undeniably ladies' men in their own ways and show-stopping front men for their respective bands. Um, yet during the Triple Threat Tour, the time took what Prince, as we've all been talking about all weekend, he really took what Prince originally created and brought it to the next level, creating a music, musical rivalry that Prince would later admit, quote, to this day they are the only band I've ever been afraid of. So in a twist of the Pygmalion myth, the creation came to life, but developed into something greater uh, than originally planned by Prince, right? Um, Han and T-Bert, I just, I love Laura, sorry. <laughs> um, state, quote, as for Prince, he saw the group as entirely his creation. He had written the songs, developed the concept, and provided the necessary resources. The group was a tangible expression of part of his psyche, and its independence was something that he could not help seeing as a threat. Um, all right, so there was indeed something crowd-pleasing and stable about the brand that the time was promoting, both visually and sonically. The band's look was more or less uniform. It did not radically change in 1984 in Purple Rain or when they regrouped for Graffiti Bridge in 1990. Um, in contrast to the consistent image of the time, the dynamic and ever-changing uh, image of prints from the 1999 album to Graffiti Bridge, if you think about how many different looks and haircuts and styles and bands and everything he has, it's a little overwhelming, right? So um, it's more challenging and uncategorical, yeah? Day uses the example of the Beatles, constantly redefining their image, which each album as a precedent to Prince's complete makeover each year. And I think if we actually stop and realize that that was like just eight years, the Beatles, right? And how much they changed. So the time was presenting a consistent look that you could set your watch to, pun intended, of course. And every one of their songs was a classic funk bop to which any spectator could not resist dancing. Um, the crowd knew what they were getting into with the time, while Prince and the Revolution might have been seen more as enigmatic. So this rivalry is a curious development in the Pygm Pygmalion trope, of course. Prince, as godlike creator, designs a band in order to channel creative energy into other musical aesthetics, and the band takes on a life of its own, ultimately upstaging Prince and the Revolution and inspiring a subplot to the film Purple Rain. The media and scholars alike 
subscribe to this myth in the context of Prince and his side projects, and even, even Day himself uses the words creation, extension of Prince, in reference to himself, and master, creator, in reference to Prince. Um, the book, or On Time, also includes Prince's name in the title, in addition to a fictionalized Prince figure as a narrative, or a second narrator, com commenting on Day's story throughout the whole book. And lest we forget, most of these texts, including Day's memoirs, were written at least a quarter of a century after the first Time album was produced. Um, although we all know it now that Prince produced the album production, and production credit was given to Morris Day and Jamie Starr, and it was not yet widely known that Starr was Prince's alias. Thus, perhaps Prince was not interested in getting public recognition as a creator of the band at the time, but I think it's probably more of a strategic thing, right? Um, either way, people didn't really know this yet. So this narrative of Prince as creator paints Prince as a supernatural, all-powerful being, therefore really negating his human characteristics of having an exceptional amount of inherent talent, but also an equal amount of ambitious work ethic, innovative ideas to execute, and a keen ability to spot and encourage talent in others. Jimmy Jem stated, quote, that what, that's what Prince did time and time again. He taught us we could do things we'd never believed we could. Um, in addition, this Pygmalion narrative of creating an entire music out of nothing negates the agency of the performers themselves. So in a Guardian article from 2016, Simon Price states that, quote, any attempts to mold or micromanage Day were always doomed to failure. And Day stated in an interview with Soren Baker for Flood Magazine in 2021 that, quote, well, Prince was always in control. That was his thing. He's like, we're going to do this pretty much. We're going to do this pretty much my way. That's better. I would get a word in edgewise every now and then and a little bit of creativity, but that was one of the things that led to us eventually kind of having a rift between us because at the time I was young, creative. I had a lot of music in my blood that I really wanted to express, and I wasn't getting any opportunity to do it. Everybody, everything had to be his way, which was not a bad way, by the way, but I still had stuff that I wanted to do, and that's what eventually led to us going our separate ways. So the fact that there are too many musical acts that could stand on their own without Prince's total control ultimately pokes holes in this Pygmalion theory. Um, in the time, of course, we have the legendary producers Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who went on to produce Janet Jackson and numerous other acts and were already from really established band The Flight Time. Um, Sheila E. had already been performing with the likes of Marvin Gaye, Diana Ross, and Lionel Richie by the time Prince noticed her and started to collaborate with her. Um, Prince's wife, uh, first wife, Maite Garcia, was actually earning more money as a professional belly dancer. I saw your jacket, by the way, yeah. <laughs> um, before she was ever on payroll at Paisley Park. And of course, even though Morris Day's early days were very much associated from uh, with Prince from high school on, he brought the time to a whole new place and developed the show-stealing character of Morris in Purple Rain. And he would ultimately go on to act in, you know, small parts in film and TV in addition to producing more of his own music and touring while maintaining status as a popular culture um, icon on his own accord. In his bio, he states that... Um, Quote, it was such an innocent time. We were just doing our thing, talking the way we talked and dressing the way we dressed, bringing our personalities to the record. It was us being us. I'm proud of where I came from musically and the things we've done. So this is, of course, not to diminish Prince's influence, but rather to attempt to shift the image of Prince's all-powerful creator to innovative producer and collaborator with an eye for talent. Prince undoubtedly mentored and platformed countless musicians through his, throughout his career. And while I thoroughly enjoyed Day's memoirs, um, they are delightful. Uh, Prince's voice, however fictionalized, was always present, and most of the book recounts his life through the context of Prince. And I, for one, am still waiting eagerly to read the rest of the details of his fascinating life. Um, thank you. And So unfortunately, unlike Zach's photo from yesterday, this is not photoshopped. <laughs> so the one time I did get to meet Morris Day, I didn't know what to say, so I just started doing the bird. <laughs> um, so enjoy.